Hello everyone and welcome to The Complete Christian. My name is Chidi. Um, if you're new to this channel, please take out time to subscribe, like and comment and share on you know, whatever you need to do to support the channel. Um, on today's video, um, I'm going to be showing a video I did a couple of weeks ago um, where I was one of the panelists in a, a meeting, um, a youth meeting for the whole of Europe in Winner Chapel, Winner Chapel Europe. Um, so we talked about um, a relationship. Um, so basically, the topic of the of the of the forum was um, called relationship leverage. So um, yeah, I was one of the contributors. So I was honoured to be there. So please, you know, watch the video and let me know what you think. Um, leave a comment uh, at the end of the video to tell me what you think. So thank you very much and and God bless you. Thank you for for watching. God bless you. You can just going to join us very soon as well. So I'm just going to make a start. So as we all know, the title for today's um, Zoom session or today's Congress, sorry, is called Relationship Leverage. So I'm just going to dive straight into it, Sister Tammy, because when we had this topic at first, a lot of people interpreted this title in a different way. So I'm just going to ask you, what does relationship leverage mean to you? So, um like I mentioned earlier, I mean, I did have to look into it because when I first got it, I thought about the same thing, like, well, how does this play out? But um, when I then thought about it in terms of relationships could be anything, relationships could be you know, about relationships with God, our relationship with our family members, our friends, our colleagues, relationships could be anything. In the, even the, in the body of Christ, for some reason, when you hear the word relationship, you're thinking man and woman, they're getting married or they're married, you know, we're always thinking marriage relationship. But we need to always find out and think of okay, what are we talking about when we say relationship. So, which is where I didn't say, okay, with the word leverage, which means advantage, mm -hmm. it's not about taking advantage of somebody, but it's just about making making the most of that relationship. Say, for example, if you had a mentor, your relationship with your mentor is for your own benefit. So you need to be the one who's stepping to that advantage as much as possible and yeah. gaining, using that access to your own benefits. Yeah, so that's yeah. you using that relationship, the leverage in that relationship or using relationship leverage in that context. It's the same thing with our relationship with God. God is our father and we know that our father is, is the many-sided God, is the many-breasted father who has all things in his, in his hands ready for us. But if you as a child, you keep running away or you're afraid to ask, you don't get to access those things that God has you know, in store for you. So that's, it's you being able to use that leverage, using that opportunity to take advantage of everything that you can get in that relationship. It's not taking advantage of off the person, it's yeah. using the advantage that you have within that relationship to your own benefit. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Sister Blessing, you're back. Yeah, yeah. So I just asked um, Sister um, Timmy what relationship leverage means to her. I mean, she's explained it at the beginning, but I just wanted to ask you personally as well, like, what does relationship leverage mean to you? So I can't really hear. Uh, yeah. uh, I think we're struggling to hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I really don't know what's wrong. All right. Relationship leverage is the strategic uh, advantage and power to act in an effective way in a relationship. Um, you know, we know, we. my understanding of leverage is making strategic actions, you know. And what I mean by that is that as Christians, I believe that we are ambassadors here on earth and we have a certain purpose which is which is to draw god draw people to the kingdom of god so when you talk about relationship leverage what comes to mind is how this strategy you employ how you take advantage of your relationship with god to draw people nearer to god mm -hmm. okay i think i think that's, that was really good i really love what you just said you said strategic advantage so it's not just like sister Tina said it's not just taking advantage of the relationship or of the person it is doing it with a purpose as well yes. so i know the anchor scripture for this for this um program was um um more about a relationship to a man and a woman it was proverbs, proverbs 18 22 
And so what do you think, what does relationship leverage mean to you when it comes to a relationship between a man and a woman? How do you interpret, how do you, how would you interpret that relationship? How could you take advantage of that relationship? Not advantage of the person, but advantage of that relationship. Yeah. So like I said, leverage is like taking strategic advantage and the power to act effectively in a relationship. So if you're in a relationship with somebody, how do you use how do you, it still it still goes back to God, you know, and being a Christian and doing things on on, on godly basis. If if you know God, if you are a child of God, how do you use that, you know, as an advantage? Or oh, when celebrities are married, their marriage is over, their this doesn't work because God is not in it. And to a good extent, that is kind of true. Because when God, when when that when God is in a relationship, that's like your leverage that you can use in a relationship between you and somebody else. It's like the power you have to act effectively to affect the relationship in the right way because of an advantage you have, which is God as Christians. Mm. Mm, I really like that. Do you have anything to add to that, Sister Timmy? Um, I I absolutely agree. I love what yeah. Sister Bethany said there about using. You know, it's it's the power, the access that you have. Um, I, I completely agree with that. And yeah. it, it's being able to maximize what is in that relationship. Because like yeah. I mentioned um, earlier, if, you, if you've laid the foundation for that relationship as God, yeah? And God is the foundation. You know, when you get married, they always say like God is, it, it's a three, it's a triangle now. Like, you know, you've got a triangle in your marriage and God is at the top of that triangle. And if in a relationship, you've been able to successfully done that, you can always you always have that power you always have that access to go back to god okay things are not going the way they should be okay yeah. god you know this is you you're in this picture as well so yeah it's taking advantage of the god factor in that relationship as well so yeah so thank you for that sister blessing um just um by the way guys if you have um like i said this is an interactive session so if you have any questions or anything you want to add, just put it in a comments box. Someone will pick it up and, and we'll ask the question. Um, we also have, um, like I said before, we have our pastors here as well. So um, anything that we think that we need to throw out to our pastors, we do. But if you have any questions, again, put it in the comments box and we attend to it. So do you think sometimes that people find it difficult to take advantage of, advantage of their relationship with God? Because, um, you know, sometimes people, I think trust as well plays an important role in this. Because sometimes a lot of people rush into things, not because they don't want to trust God, not because they don't want to take advantage of that relationship, but because they feel like, can I trust this relationship? Or can I trust that the relationship that I've built with God and I'm building with God is going to actually meet my need? We're all Christians, but sometimes I think... Um, people find it difficult to be patient and trust in that relationship. Hence why people do, you know, not stupid things, but do things that are not scriptural, do things that are probably, that they're probably not ought to do. So do you think um, trust plays an important role in this as well? I'm throwing it out to two of you. And if Brad Princewell is here as well, um, he, can, he can add to it. So what do you think? Um, I, I, I agree. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, I agree with the fact that you know trust is an issue. It's definitely an issue in any relationship. Trust is always an issue. But then again, we need to ask the question: Do you have the understanding of of this? You know, what what, what is the context of the relationship? Yeah? So, if you're married to somebody, for example. Um, I don't want to make any assumptions here, but if you're married to somebody and you know from the moment you met that person, you know, or you've built a relationship over time and you know, okay, we didn't just wake up and say, okay, right, we're going to get married. There's a process. So in that process, you're building trust, you're developing trust. There is also the understanding that we need to check the intent of perfection. Like, you know, your, what are your expectations when you signed up into that relationship? You're not expecting the person to be perfect. You, ex you would expect that things would go wrong. You know, people make mistakes, you know, like people, people get offended. We get offended every day. But it's in that understanding of, okay, I trust this person enough to be vulnerable with them and knowing that they will upset me. They will say things that, you know, would not sink very well with me. 
but it's in, in remembering that you have God, you have a relationship with God, and God is a forgiving Father, and God forgives us when we do wrong. So it's being able to apply that in your relationship as well. I believe is, you know, is is a very important thing that you should be able to understand. That, okay, if if this is what I'm feeling right now, and this is what God says about me, you know, forgiving other people, you know, um, I, I guess that's that's what then makes the difference, and that's what then determines your outcomes or your reactions in those situations. I don't know if Sister Blessing wants to add anything yeah. to that. Yeah, Blessing, do you have anything? Just before you go ahead, Sister Blessing, we also have um, Brother Chidi from Dartford. Um, Brother Chidi, are you, are you there? I am, yes. Yes, sorry for that. So Brother Chidi is also going to be part of the panel. So Brother Chidi, do you have anything to add to that? No, I don't. Okay. Yeah. Sister Blessing. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I definitely agree with her. You know, trust can really be like a big issue in relationship, especially these days, because, you know, because of obvious reasons, a lot of things are happening. People are acting wonderful. But for me, everything still boils down to God. You know, you need to learn to trust God as a Christian. As a matter of fact, you don't even have a choice. You have to trust Him. What other choice do you have, you know? And, um, you need to, people need to understand that if you make God the center of something, by the grace of God, everything is going to work. Let me just read down my definition of what a relationship here is. A relationship must be seen with the eyes of your purpose in life from God, from God. I'll just, I'll just stop there with that. And that is something we just, everything boils back to God. We always need to trust God. That is something that we just have to know. And regard to, um, you know, having shaky relationships and what not. My comment on that is that people need to learn to stick with their values because a lot of times in relationships, just because of oh, how the other partner will feel or how pushy the other person is being, you know, towards maybe asking for something that is not godly or, you know, or something that is against your morals or your values, you may want to go sideways and, you know, when 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 you do things like that that goes against your value you know we time you begin to those things begin to control you and in later relationships you may find it hard to trust so you should learn we should always learn to stick to our values because whatever you whatever you know you let to whatever you tolerate will control you later mm. that's true thank thank you for that i think i think the, the sticking point for me that you just made is that whatever you tolerate you know, so what what standards, what values do you think you need to set? This is not only for like, and let, let me say an established Christian, also for people that are still growing in the faith, because if you find that people that are still growing in the faith are usually the ones that um, kind of fall victim of things like this. So would you say for what, what standards do you feel like people should put in place to properly take advantage and to properly, you know, like you just said, put their foot down and say, I see, this is what I stand for and I'm not going to compromise because you were talking about compromise as well. So what yes. values, what standards do you think, you know, it's individual, but for you personally, what standards do you think? Jesus is my standard for living, you know. Jesus is my standard for living and that should be the standard for every true believer, every person who is truly following God. If you use Jesus as your standard of living, you follow the word, you know the way you should everything will be well with you mm. that's that's i think that's a, that's a perfect answer you know the bible is your standard the bible is because i think um so so many times now the question is well we have a pressure from around you where people give you a standard like um papa will always say that if you don't um if you don't know who you are people will tell you who you are so um one thing that i personally really stand big on big on sorry is self-discovery it's something that I really stand big on because if you don't know yourself, people will tell you who you are. Mm -hmm. So it's something that I feel like every Christian should, you know, at the start of their Christian journey should do, you know, discover yourself. Because if you don't do that, every other thing I do after that might be shaky. You might not know if this is right, this is wrong. You know, somebody might tell you that, you know, this is what the Bible says. You know, people misinterpret the Bible as well. I think that's what we need to understand as well. Um, 
So I'm just going to quickly move on just because of our time. So there's a question that we got in before this and somebody asked, he said that when the Bible says we should not be equally, unequally yoked, can we marry someone that is not as spiritually developed? That's trying to take advantage. So how can you take advantage of that sort of relationship? Praise God. I'm throwing this out to the three of you. Um, I, th I think the first question I would ask there is, when you're saying if somebody is not as spiritually mature, so you're basically saying, okay, you've got to put them on a scale, you know, but I, I guess the, the foundational question should be, are they born again? Mm. If that person is a child of God, okay, you've, and you've, you've confirmed, they've confirmed themselves because nobody, you can't say you're a child of God and not be able to say, because Bible says, you know, with the heart will believe, with the mouth will confess. So that yes. person has confessed Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It's, I don't think it's up to anybody to then try to put them on a scale of okay, where should you be or how spiritual are you? Because mm. yes, we all have, you know, um, our levels of spiritual growth and maturity. And the way we come to God is not how we should remain, you know, two years, three years down, and like we should continue to be on a on growth journey. So if they're on that journey, I don't think we should use that as a scale to judge whether they're qualified for marriage or not, because um, yes, you are you're more spiritual than they are. Uh, how do you weigh your own spirituality? Is it because you pray five times a day, or you can pray in tongues, and you know they're still their, their tongue level is not as strong as yours? You know, we have to be to be realistic with these things. If it's somebody who believes in God, they believe in God as their Lord and Savior, and they've got a purpose for their lives that God has called them into that purpose, and they're working towards it. You know, I, I think you know, take that box, take, take that box, and continue to pray for them. Yeah. And I, and the reason why I'm saying this because I'm a very, um, it's very close to home. I'm a practical example of that, and by privilege of what I went through, I'm able to actually help people yeah. get through. The as well and not judge somebody because oh, they're not as spiritual as you when i mess, met my husband I, I wouldn't say you know it was as spiritual as i was because sometimes when i prayed you always thought wow you know like you can pray like that but the truth is i look now and i'm like oh my goodness he's more spiritual than i am yeah <laughs> i have catching up to do because yeah. god god works with us in different ways we're all on a journey nobody is perfect we're so, all on a journey all so, you need is the heart that's willing and ready to go on that journey with god yeah so would you have said you learned from like you took advantage of that relationship because like you just said that he's more spiritual than you now so i'm sure you're learning from him as well yeah just taking advantage Absolutely. of that relationship i think sometimes like we just dismiss people based on what we see at the moment but we don't know yeah. you know yeah. what they're going to be in the future so if i see sister a i'm like oh sister a doesn't even pray Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, sister A might be, you know, somewhere else, and yeah. you know, you've missed that relationship. Something you could have taken advantage of. And but help Chief, them do you have anything? Her, yeah. Know. But Chief, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with um, what um, Tammy said. Um, basically, a lot of people go around and they look at the physical and what they can see. Um, to judge whether someone is spiritual. At the end of the mm -hmm. day, what is even spiritual? It's not about speaking in oh, tongues exactly. or, um, I don't know, praying, going on evangelism, all that. You know, being spiritual is basically following what the, the Bible says yeah. and being led by the Spirit of God. It's not about the, the outward appearance because even the Bible says that um, that uh, the angel of, 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 of the devil would transform himself into an angel of light and deceive people. So it's not really about, about that. So for me, if someone is born again, uh, because every, like even everybody I speak to about relationship, I said, first of all, the person has to be born again, mm -hmm. because wh what that means is that they are teachable and they, they are humble. Mm -hmm. God transforms their hearts to be humble. So even if someone like your spouse offends you because you're born again and you're humble and you're teachable, you'll be able to listen. So I wouldn't, um, the same way, like, um, um, Tammy said that when she met her husband, you know, I would say the same as well about my wife. So, but I've learned a lot from her as well because she, uh, you know, she prays, I would say she prays more than me, you know, mm -hmm. but still marriage is about complementation because she would bring something to the table that I might not have. And then I'll bring something else that, you know, she doesn't have. And then we come together and make 
um, a great family. So that's how I see. I don't see. I don't say, oh, someone needs to be this level of spirituality or this. They need to be born again, and then and then that's that's the, and like the rest um, follows. foundation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think I think that's perfect because I think sometimes people have this false expectation of perfection. Mm -hmm. You know, people are looking for perfection. People are looking, they have this um, particular image that they've built of a Christian. They have this image that they've developed over time of, a, of how a Christian is supposed to look. So when they see a Christian, they won't be able to recognize them or they will, you know, they'll pinpoint things that they might see is not what they hope, you know, to see. So somebody just asked a question. Somebody said that when you say trust, when you say trust God, what do you mean? Someone you just asked, uh, I, I believe, um, you know, Sister um, Timmy, you, you mentioned, you talked about that before. So somebody um, just needs a bit of clarity on that. When you say trust God, what do you mean? In what sense? Um, I, th I think I think trust in God gets as basic as it is. It's, do you believe in God? Yeah. And I th maybe if I'm a bit more specific. So you're, you're believing God for something, say a spouse or a job or whatever. And God has promised you, you know, according to his word. Yeah like the anchor scripture for today that he will find a wife yeah. find the good thing and obtains favor from the lord so the question is do you trust god to bring that word to pass in your life do you believe enough in that word have you received a confirmation of that word in your spirit and you're holding on to it with every ounce of expectation that you have in you trusting that you bring it to pass that's what trusting god is you're not you, when, when you trust god you leave something completely in his hand you know um, i let this in would be a few years ago actually that when when god was making eve and when god was going to create it even though he had already created male and female he was going to bring eve out for adam he had to put him to sleep and um it was, i think it was uh, the pastor was explaining the deep sleep concept that you have to be in a state of deep sleep where you completely trust god bring to pass what he has said concerning you so you go to sleep concerning you don't wake up you know you don't sleep with one eye open and one eye shut thinking is this thing going to happen how is it going to happen when is god going to do it you know like you're you're in a state of deep sleep you're in a state of rest concerning what he has spoken to you in his word and you're believing and waiting for that manifestation even to the point that you start to take actions in the direction of what you believe that's how much you've trusted or you're trusting that god will do it okay Thank you. Thank you for that. Do we have anything to add to that, Brother Chidi? It's a blessing. Um, yeah, so for... Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so what I... is the same. So trusting in God is just believing, um, like taking God that he's um, reliable That's and you it. can trust in him. Um, um, so this is, this is how I see it. God created the heaven and the earth. So if he created me, he knows more about me than I know about myself, definitely. So obviously God is outside our realm. So sometimes we don't understand what's going on, but he's outside our realm. So that means he knows what's going on, even what's going to happen tomorrow. Like he knows the beginning. He knows the, the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. So he knows everything. So if I believe in God, I should be able to trust him, you know, to be able to direct me and guide me in everything I'm doing and know that you know all things are going to work together for my good even though i can't see it right now but he's seeing it and i should be able to trust him to lead me that's how that's what i believe thank you for that it's just a blessing so somebody also asked um is god the only leverage we have if not how so how can we incorporate the other leverages to our relationship yeah. i think that's a good question actually yeah, so I was about to make a comment <coughs> about the last question, not really about truth. Yeah. Is this is a blessing? Um yes, God is like to me, if you ask me, God is everything, even the other leverage that you know you can employ. You know, with... hello, can you hear me? Yes, the line is breaking, but we can hear you. Hello, yes, we can hear you. Can we all mute our thank you? Yeah. 
So, Brent, I think your line is breaking. That's what I was saying. Hello? Okay. Um, so, so blessing, if you can hear me, just try and reconnect, please, because I think your uh, network is not very stable. So try and reconnect, please. Um, yeah, sister, um, Tammy and brother Chidi, um, yeah. do you have anything to add to that? So do you want me to, um, do you want me to read out the question again? Yes, please. Okay. It says, is God the only leverage we have? If not, how can we incorporate the other leverages to our relationship? okay i'll go i'll go first um god as a christian god is the only leverage we have i mean the bible says is in him we live move and have our being like everything we do revolves around him so even whatever we think is leverage in our uh, relationships is because he made them happen mm. So it's not really about those things. Those things come because of him. So our eyes and our attention should be always fixed on God. The Bible says we should uh, trust in the Lord with all our hearts and lean not on, on, our, on our own understanding. In everything we do, we should, you know, uh, in all, all we do, we should lean on him and he will acknowledge him and he will direct our path. So even when he directs our path, to those people that help us or that we can leverage their relationship, it's still him that directs our path to meet those people. Yeah. It's still him that orchestrates those people to come into our life. So our first focus should be on God and he will direct everything that concerns us. That's all. Do you know what scripture comes to my mind? Um, do you know um, Matthew 6, 33, you know when it says seek first the kingdom as in put God in the center of every other, of everything you do and every other thing will follow. I think that yeah. sometimes as a Christian, um, like we said before, whether we establish that trust plays an important role in us, sometimes like, we are too impatient and patience as well, you know, patience to you know that, okay, you know, I'm going to, to make that decision to say, okay, I'm going to wait on God. I'm not going to look for plan. I'm not going to create plan B. God is my only plan. Mm. Do you agree to that, Sister Timmy? I, I absolutely agree. You know, um, as um, Chidi was explaining that, I just remember the statement that my mentor made once. He said, Christ is your only advantage. Mm. And when we were talking about leverage, they were talking about the advantage. He said the fact that you have God in your life. I mean, I mean, you could be, if you walked into a, a room, for example, and you maybe you were going for an interview, and there are about 10 people in the room who are highly skilled, you know, like they've got all the experience, all the expertise and, you know, all of everything that a job requires. What you might not have all of those things, you might maybe have some of the, the knowledge or not all of the experience that they do. But the fact that you have Christ puts you at the top of that path immediately because Christ becomes your advantage in that situation. So the fact that you then have the skill, you have the opportunity, you have the experience and then on top of that you've got christ you are so loaded that nothing can fit you in this life and that applies to every area of life including in relationships and i like what she said about even when it, people come into your life and you know they become a blessing to you or people people are able to add to your life they're able to do that because god has allowed them to come into your life at the time that they did you know it, they could they couldn't have come a day later they couldn't have come a day earlier they came at the time and at the season that they did because God allowed it to be so. Somebody mm -hmm. said something to me last week that you're basically leaving a, a, a book that has already been written. Mm -hmm. Every chapter of that book has been concluded. You're just walking through it. Walking through it. So the book has been finished. You're just leaving the experience of what is written in the book that's already finished. So what are you struggling with? You know, all you need to do is trust the one who wrote the book and mm. say, right, okay, God, you've finished this race. It says, I am the author and the finisher. You have finished the race. I'm just walking through it. What do I do next? Where do I turn to next? Yes. It's as simple as that. Yes. I think like we always say, um, like our um, our youth um, coordinator here in Manchester, how he always says to us that, see, you would never go to Apple store and ask them to repair a Samsung phone. You go to the manufacturer 
you always go back to the manufacturer and god is our manufacturer so mm -hmm. you know it'll be it'll be stupid for us to say that we're going to someone else to ask for direction he created us he knows everything he knows even more than us so it would be stupid to go somewhere else thank you thank you for that i think that was very insightful actually thank you for that and um, we have another question and someone asked is there a place for emotional intelligence in any of this <laughs> Emotion. I think, especially emotions. I think we must all agree. Emotions play a massive role, especially when it comes to making decisions. Mm. Our emotions. Do you have any, Brad Chidi? I'm going to go to you first. Okay. <laughs> I I think I don't know. I don't know. I might be controversial or not, but I don't know. But I feel that the concept of emotional intelligence, it's not very scriptural. It's not very biblical. I mean, yes, people have different temperaments or whatever. But if you look at it, this is my, um, my, how I look at it. If someone is born again, first mm -hmm. of all, whatever temperament, emotion, whatever they had, um, God changes their heart and they see things through the eyes and the lens of God. So when they live their life, they live it to please God. So like say, for instance, if I was, I don't know, a very angry person, because the Holy Spirit is working in me and yes, I've been justified, but I'm going through the, the process of san, um, sanctification. So God changes my heart to become more like Christ. So in that sense, um, it, as I'm dealing with my spouse, my wife, or other people around me, I'm dealing with them through the principles of the Bible. So that, that you know, trumps whatever emotional intelligence that I might think I have. Because if the, if the Bible says, you know, treat others the way you would want to be treated, then that, that's what forms my, you know, if you call it emotional intelligence, whatever you call it, but that's what forms how I deal with people. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. So I might have the inclination to act in a certain way, but if I believe in God and his word, that guides me to mm -hmm. um, treat people in a different way. So that's that's uh, my, my, own, um, my own take I on think, that. I think sometimes... I don't like you said it might be a bit controversial but i personally think yes if you're born again you have the holy spirit you exhibit the fruits of the spirit and that helps you in that aspect but do you think that sometimes as christians we still have that li like i was listening to a preacher some time ago and somebody said the pastor said that see even in the heat of an argument sometimes your um before born again character still comes to show and i was like how do you control that how do you say that your before born again character still comes to show like do you think that sometimes um we you know we allow our emotions to overwhelm us or to kind of take you know to to kind of um take more you know play a bigger part in our lives than you know us saying okay you know i've got the holy spirit and you know, there's a certain way or the certain you know way I, I behave now, and I'm not that kind of person anymore. Did yeah, I mean, oh, Brashidi, sorry. Okay, so yeah, the, the the thing is that when we live by the principles of God, it 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 it, it um helps us to sort of like you know, because the Bible says we should um, live by the spirits, and then we'll quench the desire of the flesh, isn't it? So when you have those fleshly thing, you know coming up that you want to satisfy yourself if you're being led by the spirit and you you practice discipline spiritual discipline it helps you to put those things in um in in check you know um the same way that paul said that he puts his flesh into subjection because he wants to attain the mark isn't it so and let me give you an, an example so uh, there's someone um in a very good friend of mine in 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 that for church that okay. um you know we had a we had a, a business together we worked together and he did something that you know um someone would say wow why did he do something like that to you and it was really offensive right mm -hmm. so next next sunday i meet this guy in church and my wife saw me hugging this guy and shaking him i was like what like he did all that to you and you're do you understand like yeah, yeah. so um and so from that my wife has actually learned something so 
sometimes it's not really about us fulfilling the desire of our flesh because that time you want to get back at him and revenge or whatever mm. but if you learn the bible you see that the bible said that the revenge is of the lord god does the revenge you don't do it yourself you know the bible asks us to put on the sword the bible asks us to you know be gentle be wise as a serpent but gentle as a dove all yeah. these principles when you have them in your in your in your mind and you practice them it helps you to live so it, it helps you to um, live a more Christ-like, you know, life. Because at the end of the day, our life is to bring glory to God. So if we do what the unbelievers do, how does that bring glory to God? We have to be, a, a, we are different, isn't it? We are a royal priesthood, a peculiar people. So we have to be different in the way we deal with other people. And it's God and his word that helps us to develop that kind of life. Mm, thank you. So blessing, do you agree to that? Yes, I do. Even if I was breaking up a little, I couldn't quite hear everything. But from what I've heard, I do agree to. Yes, quickly wanted to say about the, uh, the question that you asked about being unequally yoked, you know, with somebody. Is it okay if I just say something about that? Okay. Okay. Okay, so I was going to say that I agree with the others on it about, you know, about, you know, not being able to say, or oh, um, somebody is not, is someone is not up to you, that what is, what do you truly use to measure that? And I agree that a lot of times we do see things from a superficial note, but I want people to understand that the Bible says that two cannot work except they agree let's take example let's take an example from you know in the farm you know when they put like a wooden beam you know on like a pair of let's say oxen or cows just to till the farm or something you know if the two of them if the two beams are not you know the same size or something it's going to be hard for the two animals to continue and you know what you want you know but it's also good to look at these things and use that analogy to understand that you know sometimes things can be difficult let's say for example as a woman you are called you know to speak all over the world to do different kind of things and you are with another christian also a believer but who is not yet strong in the faith and cannot understand these things he or she is likely to stand as a barrier to your purpose in life. And that is why it is very important to ask questions, pray very well before you make a decision about a partner. Yes, the person might be a, a Christian. Yes, there's potential for growth, but you need to do it wisely. You need to ask God before you make those decisions. Yes, thank you for that. I think the person, when the person asks a question, I think that's exactly what I was trying to head at because um, yes, we, we shouldn't judge, but then at the same time, can that person be a barrier to your own spiritual growth? When that person starts to pull you down or when that person starts to, you know, make you do things that you usually don't do, um, it just shows that you yourself, you need to grow. But at the same time, when we say do not be unequally yoked, I think that's what the Bible is referring to that. See, if, uh, if this, because we said that, yes, he's a Christian, but at, at the same time, some people claim to be Christians, but they're not. Um, some people claim to, um, you know, practice, but they don't. So if another person pulls you down in that way, like it's like it rightly says it's a blessing, you know, pray about it. Um, I think that's a tricky one. And I think, um, you know, praying about it is the best thing you can do. Um, well, thank you. Sorry, can, I, can I just chip in on that? Yes, I was just going to say that that's where the sentiment is very key when it comes to things like that. You're not going into this decision with your head or your heart. You're going with your spirit. When I made that decision, yeah. I made the decision with my spirit. I asked for confirmations and multiple confirmations. Even God knew that I was on a mountain of confirmation because I, need, I, I needed to grow. I was on a growth journey. I wasn't trying to put myself as somebody who's perfect and is already there. Nobody is there with God. We're all on a journey. So it's helping that yourself and that person to understand that we're going to grow together. So that's where you need to be discern, discerning and knowing, are they truly believers or are they just forming being a believer by going to church, check. Um, I pray in the morning, check. I read my Bible once, check. It's not a checklist. 
it's a lifestyle. And that's yeah. when you start to discern, okay, does this person actually, when you when they open their mouth to say things, does it does he align with the word of God or is it completely against the word yeah. of God? That's when you start to draw your line. So it's not yeah. a decision of the heart or the head. It's a decision of the spirit. So you're listening with your spirit, man. And on the question of emotional intelligence, I'm just going to say one thing, and I think both these students would um, relate to this. Man is a spirit. <laughs> he has a soul and he lives in a body. So if you're making your decisions based on your soul, you still have a long way to go because your spirit man needs to be at the top of that pack. You're making not emotional, inte emotionally intelligent decisions, but spiritually inclined decisions. That's where, I think that's where I draw the line. Where do you, where do you differentiate your emotional, this is me thinking with my, you know, I'm very clever. I know exactly what I'm doing, mm. but is that what God wants you to be? Is that where God wants you to be? Are you making a decision today because, oh, yeah, I'm very happy. You know, the guy makes me very happy or the woman, oh, my goodness, she can cook. You know, you're, are you making that decision based on that or are you making it based on your purpose, based on your what God has said concerning yourself? And I think somebody mentioned this earlier about, you know, identity. You have to discover who you are first. That yeah. is the, the basic of the basic. You discover who you are first and it's in your relationship with God that you start to find yourself. Because you look into the mirror of the word and you see who God says you are before you can even start throwing yourself into any other kind of relationships. That's probably why your, your relationship with your coworkers is a bit dodgy because you, you've not understood what it means to be a spirit man. When you're a spirit man, you don't go in the flesh attacking people. You, or even when people come to you in the flesh to attack you, you don't respond in the flesh, you respond in the spirit. What would Jesus do is your response in any relationship. But that comes from you having a solid self-identity that is formed in Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. That was a strong message. You know, it's not a checklist. I think that's something I'm going to remember. Thank you so much for that. Um, we've got a question. Somebody's raising their hand, Brother Austin. Um, Brother Austin is raising his hand. I'm just going to unmute. I'm just going to unmute you so you can ask your question. Okay. Uh, it's totally something I could do one of us. Good evening. Everyone, thanks for the wonderful contribution since. I've come to discover what? most times when we talked about uh, this uh, spirituality and uh, uh, putting uh, this uh, stuff about being born again in choosing a partner. But I've come to discover most times that it is even the so-called born again, so to speak, that are even finding it more difficult to even challenging to obey the these uh, principles and this law once it comes to marriage or comes to everything about life because one thing i've come to discover with people even in the kingdom some can 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 yes they are born again but obeying the laws is another different thing entirely you understand me so when we say only being born again as as the foundation as only stuff yes good but i think that we also being able to see the person being able to obey when it comes to things that has to do with the word. Because the Bible said, according to Papa, Papa said it's not just only knowing the truths, it's about doing the truths and living by the truths. That's what makes you free. You understand me? So I've seen a lot of Christians, even in the church, you see them every day, totally, you don't have any issue with them being born again. But obeying the word, some settings, you see them and picking some things, you see some puzzle. I've been able by God's grace to talk to some people that's for this marriage and relationship counseling stuff. When you hear some pastor, you're talking to the wife and the husband, you begin to see this one be quoting the verses of the Bible that, that, that will suit them, the other one quoting the verses of the Bible that will suit them. But the ability where the man needs to love the wife to your death, the way of that aside, the ability where the woman needs to totally submit the, the way of that aside, and only quote different sections of the Bible that, that profit them. For me, I would think that uh, uh, not just only being born again, that shouldn't just only be what we should also use. Mm. Being also being able to look at the individual himself, the ability for the person to totally give in to God. Because if he cannot totally give in to the word of God, because marriage entirely has its own principles, has its own rules, which is totally different from everything. God instituted it and he put down the law, how it's going to work. So one of the things that causes some of these challenges are not just only people being born again or no spiritual order, is, the, is them not obeying that word, that rules, that principle. Yeah. Which God laid down. Yeah. Those are the major re re reasons for yeah. that. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you for that contribution, sir. Thank you so much. Um, we have another person. Um, Sorry, can I say something on that? 
Yes, sorry. Okay, so this is um, what I believe. You know what, what he was saying that there are some people that are born again and um, they're not obeying the word or the laws. So the Bible says there are people who have the form, a form of godliness, but yeah. they deny the power. So mm -hmm. they have a form, they look holy, they look like they're deacons, not just those deacons that say, it is better, bless you, it is there, it is working. <laughs> you know, those kind of, you know, people in church, um, they have the form of godliness, but they are probably not born again. Just going in, going to church doesn't mean you're born again. The, if, if, uh, the bishop says that um, you can be in church, but not in touch, you know, yep. God doesn't know you. You know, so some people have the form of godliness, but they're not actually born again. So that's what people need to find out first before they get into a relationship with those people. And then the second thing is, like I said, once you get born again, you're justified. You're a child of God. That is it. That is it. That's what the Bible says. But after that comes sanctification. Mm -hmm. That is the journey, you know, that the Holy Spirit works on you to become more and more like Christ. And how does that work? That works from, the Bible says that we should be transformed through the renewing of our mind. Yeah. You know, just because someone is born again doesn't mean that automatically he starts acting yeah. God like he needs to learn what the Bible says about a Christian and who he is and how he should act. And that's where studying, um, listening to, you know, spirit filled word that will change, transform that person um, slowly, but surely that person becomes transformed and start be acting Christ like. So that's a, that's what I need to say on that. So I okay. thought it's really important to, to stress that because not to confuse people who have a form of godliness in church, but yeah. they're not really born again. Yeah. Yeah. Can, I, can I just add here that um, sometimes when we use the term born again, it's it's almost like it's become, I don't know, it's, it's, it's just become a title. You know, I'm a born again. What does that mean? The, we, we are forgetting that the process of being born again is step one. Like mm -hmm. the moment that you come to Christ is when you become born again. By day two, you are not, I'm not, it's not a title. You know, it's not an emblem that you carry around where I'm a born again. What does that mean? If you are a believer, so it means that the day you became born again, so you're reborn, yeah? So you've been reborn, you've entered new birth. That day is day one of a journey of a lifetime. So on that journey, you're growing every day. You're going through the process of sanctification. You're going through the renewal of your mind by the Holy Spirit. You're working on your character because just because you were born again does not mean that your character has automatically been transformed. You need to work on that. You need to take yourself through the process of reforming your character. And it's in those ways that things like marriage will start to really reveal who you are. If you've not worked on your character, you know, I, I was listening to T.D. Jakes many years ago. He said, not, no miracle happens at the altar when you get married. If that person came to the altar with stinky socks, you're going home with stinky socks that night. No miracle has transformed their stinky behavior. So you're the one that needs to go back behind the scenes and work on your character before you even, and that's why I would encourage people, before you even enter marriage, before you even start thinking marriage at all, you need to fix your character. Because mm. it's when that happens that you can then go into marriage knowing that, come what may, I'm ready for this. Yes. So I just need to add that. Yes, thank you so much for that. Thank you. So I think I think your question has been answered, Brother Austin. Thank you for that question because we've got another person. I'm just trying to manage our time because we're running out of time. Um, I'm just going to take one last question from Brother Kachi. I'm just going to unmute you. Okay. Sorry, one second. There you go. Hello. Can you hear me? So it, it wasn't um, it wasn't a question. I just wanted to contribute to. Um, what was said, and I think uh, Chidi um, um, expressed a lot of what I wanted to say in response to, uh, first of all, our brother Austin, and probably the initial question that came regarding uh, being unequally yoked. Uh, both, both, again, I, I think I quite agree with uh, Chidi that there is an appearance um, of godliness or appearance of maturity and spirituality by the languages or even quoting so many scriptures or even being committed. But uh, we should not confuse that with actually walking in the spirit, being mm -hmm. obedient, and we should not confuse that with being mature. And this is where, uh, you know, a lot of confusion is we, we sort of uh, confuse uh, the outward appearance with um, actually the, the, 
practice of uh, spirituality. The Bible says we should exercise ourselves to godliness, and that's a process. Um, but if I go back to the spirit of the question that, that came um, initially regarding being unequally yoked, um, I just wanted to add to what uh, Tammy said and, and Chidi as well uh, mentioned. So first of all, we agree that the context uh, in which that scripture was, uh, was uh, said was not even talking about uh, believers. It was talking about unequally yoked with unbelievers. It was talking about light and darkness. And so, again, within that context, it was talking about Christians having fellowship with darkness or people of the world getting married to unbelievers and all of that. Um, the way we've answered it uh, so far has been uh, compatibility, spiritual compatibility within uh, believers. And uh, so I just thought I should just uh, throw a little bit uh, mm -hmm. into that if we would like to go that way. And the, and the, the spirit of the question is, should someone who is spiritual, as we use the word, I'll probably usually stay away from using the word spiritual. I'll probably stay, go towards using the word mature because that's very clear. Everyone who is born again, the Bible says, is born of the spirit. If you're not born of the spirit, you're not born again. He that is born of the flesh is flesh. He that is born of the spirit is spirit. So everyone that is born again is a spiritual being fundamentally. Uh, so we're born again. Um, as Tammy alluded, we grow from that point on, from day one, we start to grow. Uh, but the spirit of the question is, um, is there any way that we know that someone is mature? What's the yardstick to measure? Yes, there is a yardstick, um, clearly. And there's a yardstick from scriptures. Um, when I married my wife, my wife immediately knew that I was more spiritual than she is, or I was more mature, if I want to use the word. I, um, it was very clear. How did she know that? Because she, she knew that based on very clear scriptural uh, um, uh, mandate. And I, I like um, Tammy's um, 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 anecdote. You know, there was a bit of, um, spiritual imbalance she got married and now the husband is that way i can say mine as well when i married my wife it was very clear again it's not about judging or not judging there are clear spiritual parameters within which we can judge who is mature and who is not mature the bible talks about growing and taking the milk of the word of god to grow to this level and that level if we if i just go straight to the scriptures uh, first of all but let me just read first Corinthians chapter one three plus one to three says <laughs> sorry go one minute to do this Okay, okay, so I'll probably leave the scriptures out then. <laughs> I'll, I'll no, probably leave out. Leave, read the scripture, but you've got one minute. <laughs> okay, okay, so, um, so um, I'll just quickly read. You said, but solid food is for the mature uh, who, by constant use, have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Uh, is for the mature. So there's something called mature and immature. I married my wife, and um, there's something I saw in my wife. And the, the only reason why I'm just introducing this aspect is that. Um, yes, I'm level 10, say for example, or you judge yourself level 10, whatever maturity, and you say the person I want to get married is level one. The question is, should I get married to that person? The answer can be yes, and the answer can be no. In Timmy's example, the answer was yes. In my example, it was yes. But what did I see that made me marry my wife, even though I was, again, I'm just making that up, level 10 and level one, is what we call hunger. My wife had mm -hmm. hunger. There was a seed of God in her. I saw hunger. Now, it's very, it's very possible for someone to be here and the person is not growing. And again, I won't read it. Read uh, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1 to 3. You see where Paul was complaining that. I cannot speak to you as spiritual because you're still being driven by the flesh. You have people mm -hmm. who have given their life to Christ once and they're still walking in the realm of the flesh. And there is no level of hunger. There's no level and desire to grow. The answer is no. Okay, so the question is not whether can I marry the person if, level, if the person is on this level and I'm on this level. It can be yes, if there's a hunger. And you can see that with time, people grow when there's a hunger. But if there is no growth and if there's no hunger, that would be a source of frustration. And finally, let me just give you an example of someone, someone in church that gave me this example. They've been married for more than 15 years. And today, his marriage is a source of so much pain and regret. Every time we speak, he says to me, my wife is not spiritual. And I regret getting married. And it plays out when there's no growth, when there's no hunger, when it's time for decision making. You see, maturity is about discerning between right and wrong, good and evil. You want your children to go this way. Your husband wants your children, based on his maturity, to go this way. You're, you're okay if your children come back from a night party by 3 a.m. in the morning and your husband feels, as a mature Christian, that's not the way I want my children to grow. There can be a very big disparity and a cause for division in marriage when there is no growth and a level of understanding that is compatible. So um, I just thought I should just introduce that to say it's also important to consider maturity level as long as the other person who is probably 
uh, low at this time, is willing to grow, is hungry to grow, and can come up to a level where there is unity in the marriage. God bless you. Thank you so much, Barakachi, for that. And thank you, everybody. I mean, our time is fast, man. We could, you know, talk about this for hours. You know, two hours is not enough. But thank you so much, Barakachi, Sister Tammy, Sister Blessing, and everybody that contributed. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm just going to quickly round this up because um, our, um, our um, youth pastor is going to come up now just to give us a final word and to um, just to round everything. So I'm just going to invite Pastor Emmanuel to round it up for us. Thank you, everybody. Let's just clap for everyone of us and let's just give him a round of applause as he comes.